Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. We are now kicking off the 2014 session of the Rhode Island General Assembly, and to begin our series of the legislative issues for Labor Vision, we're pleased to have George Nee with us. George, thank you for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. A great show. <laughs> Appreciate the vote of confidence. <laughs> George, uh, you don't need any introduction. Uh, people know that you're the head of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO. In fact, you recently uh, won re-election. When did that happen? Uh, we had our constitutional convention uh, in October, and uh, I ran for re-election, and I'm honored to have received the uh, unanimous support of uh, the delegates from the 250 local unions that are made up, uh, make up the Rhode Island AFL CIO, and Maureen Martin, our secretary treasurer, who is a field rep for the Rhode Island Federation of mm -hmm. Teachers and Health Professionals, was also reelected. So uh, it's a vote of confidence. I appreciate it very much, and our job is to you know, continue the fight for the working men and women of the state. Yeah. I think most of our viewers probably have no idea how one gets to be a head of a, a labor union or the head of the AFL CIO. It's real important to remind everyone. We're a democracy, and you run for election on a regular cycle, just like all of our local union leaders do. That's correct. We, uh, our affiliates, uh, uh, again, there's 250 local unions, probably representing about uh, 30 or 40 different international unions. They elect delegates. Those delegates come to a convention, and uh, uh, we have an open democratic process, uh, and uh, we're elected. So uh, that's... Uh, it's important, you're right, for people to understand that uh, because uh, it, it says a lot about the democracy of the organization and how we make decisions. Right. And uh, I've, this is one of the first conventions I've missed in 20 years. I had a, a daughter's uh, wedding well, reception. Well, that, 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 you, you made the right decision. <laughs> I, I, I had a, a good excuse, but uh, you had a, a, an interesting uh, new venue uh, for your convention. Tell our viewers yeah, where we, you were. Uh, we went up to uh, Twin River for the first time. Twin River is a uh, tremendous corporate uh, employer in our state. Uh, it was uh, built 100% union with union tradespeople, uh, and uh, there are about seven or eight different unions that uh, provide the workforce up there. So we felt it would be important to show a vote of confidence to them. It was a great venue, and uh, uh, it worked out terrific. So we'll probably be back there again, and we urge people to go up there and enjoy the uh, facilities up there. It keeps the Rhode Island economy going. And it keeps union workers working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of the big success stories oh, of our, our economy at, these days, isn't it? No subsidy mm -hmm. at all. Just let them do their job up there, and they've done a great job. Yeah, that's terrific, George. So before we talk about what your agenda and labor's agenda is for the 2014 year, uh, why don't you give us a couple of minute recap on what was the good and the bad and the ugly from the 2013 session? It was a pretty good year for the labor uh, movement, wasn't it? I would say, uh, given over the last four or five years, we uh, made a pretty good rebound. Uh, we're very proud uh, that we were a major force uh, in an increase in our state's minimum wage. Uh, it increased uh, from $7.75 to $8, effective this January 1st of 2014. Uh, that affects a lot of people. Uh, it has a, a growing impact in the economy. Uh, and now we are, as a state, 75 cents above the federal minimum wage, which is horrendous at $7.25. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that went into effect in 2008 or 9. Um, so that means 75 cents an hour. Someone's working 40 hours a week. That's about you know, $28, $30 more a week in their pocket. That's significant. Right. Uh, we were also part of the coalition. Uh, that was successful in uh, providing or allowing uh, marriage equality, uh, gay marriages uh, to take place in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, we were part of that because we saw it as a workers' rights issue and a labor rights issue uh, in terms of giving everybody a, an equal chance uh, to the uh, laws and benefits uh, that uh, come with marriage. Uh, we were successful also in 
preventing the state of Rhode Island from eliminating uh, Veterans Day, uh, uh, Victory Day or VJ Day as it's commonly mm -hmm. known. Uh, there was an effort to do that. We felt very strongly that's a very important holiday uh, for the working people of our state and for the veterans of our state, all, many of which are the same people. Uh, the uh, state uh, also uh, reinstituted the historic tax preservation uh, uh, tax breaks, which we feel are critical to uh, sort of getting economic development going in the state of Rhode Island, but with a provision now for the first time that any uh, project over $10 million, uh, of a, a $10 million in scope would have to have an apprenticeship uh, program attached to it, a bona fide apprenticeship program, which will allow for the training and education of our, uh, the, the workforce of the future. Yeah, we had Senate Majority Leader Donnie uh, Ruggiero uh, on the show last year talking about that. And that's an important feature because not only is it the one time shot in the arm to our economy, but we want to make sure that we're always training our, our younger workers to, uh, to, you know, get into the workplace and be productive themselves in the future. It's more of a long term view, I think, having provisions like that. Correct. On the sort of the negative side, uh, the state, after many, many years, finally uh, enacted a provision to allow employers to pay workers uh, biweekly. However, there was a, uh, an amendment to that or a part of the bill that passed uh, still, re, uh, still allows for union members um, to maintain weekly pay unless they bargain it away. So uh, we do have the protection for the union workforce. Uh, we believe it was bad legislation for everybody, but at least the union workers were protected. Uh, George, I, um, I've heard you testify on that for uh, <laughs> dozens of times. I always liked the idea about the one paycheck a year strategy. Yeah, yeah we, uh, we were always open to compromise. You know, we'll, we'll get paid weekly, but as long as it's, uh, I mean, paid once a year, but as long as it's in advance. <laughs> <laughs> they never bought that argument. Yeah, go figure. Uh, we were, again, uh, a little, di very disappointed that the, uh, the legislature did not pass a meaningful definition of a, an employee as opposed to an independent contractor. Once again, that passed the Senate, got hung up in the House. We believe uh, that that uh, will uh, be successful this year, but uh, once again, it was a little bit of a disappointment. And uh, also, the uh, state started on the right track. Uh, providing some funding for a uh, full day kindergarten uh, there's pilot projects or in districts that needed some help to get started so I think that that is also important you know for the education of our children but it's also I believe an economic development issue in terms of having a, a, a well-educated workforce is the best thing we can do for economic development. Yeah, particularly in some communities that have the least resources right. to provide yeah, for their kids. Everyone should start at the same starting line. Mm -hmm. you know, some kids shouldn't be starting 10 yards behind and then say, well, geez, how come you finished 10 yards mm -hmm. behind? Well, we started 10 yards behind, so mm -hmm. hopefully that'll go in the right direction. Yeah. And then finally, that uh, issue of uh, child care workers? Mm -hmm. The child care workers, this was uh, very significant. Uh, the state of Rhode Island uh, has allowed for the unionization of child care workers. Uh, that was a very contentious issue for a number of years. I uh, want to uh, compliment uh, Governor Chafee for not succumbing to the pressure of uh, a number of groups that thought this was the end of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. The House and Senate leadership were terrific on that issue, and it passed by a pretty good margin. Uh, since that time, uh, there has a, been a union election uh, conducted by the State Labor Relations Board. I think the vote was somewhere around like 350 to 10, so the workers obviously expressed the, again, in a democratic way, a secret ballot election. So those negotiations are underway, and that'll be an opportunity for about 500 uh, child care workers to have a voice and a say on their job uh, for the children that they care, take care of, which is, again, very important to our economy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's terrific. It sounds like uh, overall it was a pretty yeah, solid. Talking year about, it, I think we did even better than I thought we did. <laughs> and I'm sure if we thought about it a little yeah, more, there'd a be few, a few there's other. There's a few more in there. I hope I haven't offended <laughs> anyone that uh, that uh, was part of the the team. Sure. Um, let's talk about uh, this year. So. Last year was productive. This year's an election year, and sometimes yeah. it's a little more challenging to move legislation through the assembly uh, when the, all the senators and reps are facing election this fall. Um, what are you What are you putting on the table? Yeah. What's the labor yeah. movement going to prioritize this session? Well, we see uh, we see every year as an opportunity. You know, we it, it's uh, you start all over. 
Uh, you, uh, you, you survey the situation. You're right. It's a political year. Some people see that as an, an excuse to do nothing. I see it as an opportunity for them to do some very positive things. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be, again, seeking an increase in the minimum wage. Uh, now, the, the increase uh, that was effective in January was the second in two years. It was the second in two years. Mm -hmm. um, we, we talk a lot about being competitive with our neighbors and everyone in the business community is always talking about taxation and other issues. How we, well, if we're going to be competitive, let's be competitive at every level. Connecticut just went up to $9 an hour wow. and is going up to nine seventy on January 1st of 2015. Wow. Massachusetts is at 8 however, there is a strong push in the, in fact, they've already passed a bill to increase it to $10 an hour over a couple of years in the Senate. And if there's no action on that in, the general, in their General Assembly, they're going to put, a, it's going to be a ballot initiative that the labor movement, along with a number of community groups, is involved in. So we could end up being a dollar to, to more than, well, mm. by next year, we could be a dollar seventy behind. Now, think of it this way. I see this as our state is exporting money to corporate headquarters outside of Rhode Island. The price of a hamburger at McDonald's or Burger King or a piece of Kentucky Fried Chicken in Connecticut is the same price as it is in Rhode Island, right across the border. So the worker in Rhode Island is going to be making a dollar, or if we do nothing, a dollar seventy less an hour than the Connecticut worker, and conceivably the same amount in Massachusetts. That's like seeing, that's like watching your money fly out of the state. Our feeling is that the way you build an economy is from the bottom up. Take care of the people at the lowest income levels, give them some money in their pocket, and they'll spend the money in the Rhode Island economy. Mm -hmm. Um, there's going to be a chart that you're going to see in a second, which puts this in some very clear terms of what a minimum wage worker makes versus the amount that the uh, corporate uh, CEOs of certain corporations that employ a lot of minimum wage workers make per hour. If that doesn't tell the story in the kind of economy, and we're talking about income equality, that says it probably uh, better than anything. So that'll be a, a big push, and I think we're picking up some uh, momentum on that. Um, we're also uh, going to be uh, bringing back uh, a, a top priority is to finally get a good definition of misclassification uh, of an employee so that uh, we stop the misclassification of employees as independent contractors. What that this, means... This has a big budget issue. Oh, it's, uh, it's, doesn't it's it? potential. Okay. It's mm -hmm. tremendous. I mean, you've got thousands of workers who are being misclassified in the state of Rhode Island. That means the employer is not paying into income tax, mm -hmm. workers' comp, unemployment insurance, TDI, Social Security. So if that worker gets injured, laid off, hurt, et cetera, there's no program to help them when there should be. And we're losing tax revenue. And we're also hurting the good employers. So this is a, uh, I don't understand any business uh, opposition to this. I, I can't figure it out. The only, the only people that should be opposed to this are the cheats and the frauds and the scoundrels. <laughs> and if they want to form a lobbying association and get up to the state house and testify that, hey, cheating works, that's good. Let them, let them make their case. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we, uh, we're hopeful uh, on that one. Uh, we are going to, uh, again, push uh, at the state level. We do have a program right now in the state that provides for apprenticeship programs um, for uh, projects over one million dollars. These we, are building and construction the, the, trade jobs? Building and construction trade jobs on public projects that the state funds. We want to expand that to specify that it would apply to all quasi-publics, all state projects, uh, you know, the quasi-publics in addition to the state project. But there would be a, uh, a criteria that at least 15% of the hours on those projects would go to apprentices, similar to the, what we've done with Building Futures with a lot of memorandums of understanding with uh, some cities and with Brown and other places. So, we are training the workforce of the future in addition to enhancing our public infrastructure. Yeah. Give our viewers a sense on what these quasi-publics are because... Of oh, uh, <laughs> the Convention Center, uh, the uh, Rhode Island Resource Recovery, the airport, um, 
I guess those, uh, the water supply board, I mean. Those are pretty big Oh uh, yeah, they, they, well then they do a lot of construction. Right. You know, so between the, so that's, a, that's a, a, an initiative that uh, we'll be pursuing. Um, just check my notes here for a second. You know, <laughs> as you move along here, you have to, you can't keep everything up in your head. Um, oh, one of the things that we were, again, going to make us a priority is maintaining Victory or VJ Day in the state of Rhode mm -hmm. Island. Uh, we again feel that that's a, uh, uh, they've m wrapped it up as an economic development issue. Uh, I think they're, uh, you know, searching for an issue here. Uh, Lots of states have unique holidays. Exactly. And, and Rhode Island's not an outlier. We're, you know, they have, you know, Massachusetts has, has their own holiday. Uh, uh, Bunker Hill Patriot. Day and, yeah. and Patriot's, Patriots Day. Let Day. them go up there and see, take away Patriot's <laughs> Day these days. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is very important to our veterans to remind people, listen, we lost that war, we wouldn't be here. Right. Or we'd be here, we might be speaking another language. Mm -hmm. So it's important for history's sake that we remember the sacrifices that people made to, you know, maintain our freedom, and uh, that's just not one that uh, should ever be touched. Who's really pushing that? You know, I, I, I can't figure it out sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, there's too many think tanks, and uh, some mm -hmm. people get together and they just they brainstorm a little bit, which is good to do, but, you know, sometimes... Half of those ideas should be left on the cutting floor, and that's right. one that should have been left on that cutting floor a long time ago. Um, the um, well, there's a couple of other issues that you know, obviously we uh, perennial issues. One is that uh, in terms of the budget issues, I believe there'll be an effort to increase the income eligibility for child care. Uh, it, for people to uh, be able to take advantage of child care as our economy improves and people get back to the workforce. I, I have to tell you, the cuts to the state subsidy for child care oh. really made a life miserable for a lot of low-income yes. people, people who wanted to work but couldn't yeah. because uh, they had child care well, issues and no help. We're the lowest in New England now. Uh, as a, if The eligibility is, I believe, 175 percent of the uh, federal poverty level, which mm -hmm. is pretty low to begin with. Uh, but some of the other states are much higher than that, so therefore more, you know, again, all of these things tie into an economic development package in terms of what really helps us move people into the workforce. We'll also be, as we did last year, uh, advocating for, at, you know, three or four million dollars more in the state budget for revenue, uh, as general revenue going to our job training and workforce development programs, which really work. They're doing a great job. Uh, we have waiting lists for a lot of these programs, particularly the uh, ESL and GED programs that are run by a lot of these great community organizations. Uh, we have been trying uh, every year advocating for more money for the developmentally disabled community, mm -hmm. which took some very uh, significant cuts uh, three or four years ago. We've been getting some money back, but... Um, you know, again, that, that, was what, that was wrong. It was wrong then, it's still wrong now, and we have to restore that to at least the levels before those cuts took place. Not only was it a, a cut to workers, many of whom are well, low wages in yes. the first place, but it led to cuts in programs for, for our, yeah. our folks who, who need programs the most. You know, if, if, if we as a society can't take care of that constituency, those groups of people, that uh, you know uh, have shown a tremendous ability to gain independence and participate in in our society with some needed assistance and some opportunities. Then you know we're, who are we? Mm -hmm. I mean that's what we have to really start examining. I mean the, the budget always should be seen as a moral document because it really sets forth our values. And until we get to the point where we take care of all of these different folks, then uh, we're just uh, falling short of our, our, our moral uh, objectives. So I guess that's a, a good way to end it. And, and that, uh, it sure unless is. you have any other questions, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we'll find some other issues along the way. Uh, we always find issues that, that <laughs> or come they across. find us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and defense is always something that the labor movement has always held as a high priority in the state house because lots of bad ideas come flowing downstream that we have to deal with and we do our best to protect yeah. the working people. Well, we're you know we we participate in this. It's a it's a democratic uh, society, and uh, the labor movement is uh, committed to participate both in the. Uh, electoral sy system in terms of getting people elected that support our issues, but also 
carrying that into the legislative session to make sure that, you know, and again, I, I guess I'll leave you with one concept. I, I, I one of my pet peeves uh, over the years has been this special interest label. That, and I don't know who they're talking about because mm -hmm. they never define it, but I assume that they're referring to us oftentimes. That's a fair assumption. And uh, you know, I, I, it really bothers me because when I look out, and we look out as a labor movement, to the variety and, uh, and, and diversity of issues that we're involved in, to call us a special interest is an insult. We mm -hmm. are the people's lobby. When we fight for unemployment insurance and TDI and workers' comp and minimum wage and child care and health care and education, mm -hmm. that affects everyone. That doesn't just affect the labor. We are the force that allows this to happen. And, and thank God that we have the guts to do it. And uh, you know we're proud to be the people's lobby. Well said, <laughs> and you speak for not only yourself, but all of us in the labor movement who work day in and day out to make everyone's lives better when we do our work in the State House and everywhere else. George, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your uh, coming in here. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly into your living room. And please uh, tune in. Over the next several months, we're going to be bringing in other labor leaders, uh, senators and reps who sponsor uh, legislation that is of great interest to working people. For nearly three decades, Labor Vision TV has been covering topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. When Verizon workers, IBEW, Local 2323, provided an information rally to the general public while they were on strike, Labor Vision TV was there to cover that event. When ATU, the Amalgamated Transit Union, Division 618, we're celebrating 100 years of providing quality public transportation to Rhode Island residents. We covered that event as well. Today, we cover issues like kneecap testing and graduation requirements and its impact on Rhode Island students. We look forward to providing many more years of covering current Rhode Island events and hosting our legislative series with Jim Parisi, as well as spotlighting our grievance of the week. Hi, my name is Jim Riley. I'm Secretary Treasurer of United Food and Commercial Workers Local 328. And my gripe of the week has to do with the Walmart Corporation, a company that wages war on its own workers. My grievance of the week is the growing inequality in America, especially when it comes to what we pay low-wage workers in the service industry. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. I want to recognize the leaders and the union members who work at Twin River. About 900 union members, as we heard John say, make their living out there and make a good living. Labor's 271, Teamsters 251, Unite Here 217, Plumbers and Pipefitters 51, IBEW 99, SEIU 334, and when we have entertainment out there, the stagehands, Local 123. The Block Island Wind Farm Project is, uh, is contemplated as an eight wind turbine project about three miles off of the southeastern coast of Block Island, which would provide uh, uh, about 30 megawatts of electricity to Block Island. Central Falls was a wake-up call for teachers across this country. That's when they began to realize that this so-called reform movement was different. That it's not about improving education, but about taking power. Instead of attacking the root causes of low academic achievement and low test scores, which are not necessarily the same, it was attacking teachers. And for the past year, we've seen this movement, which I call the corporate reform movement, treat teachers as public enemy number one. Thank you for coming. Thank you for spending the day with us, but more importantly, thank you for spending the day with each other. Every other profession, the professionals in the field control it. It is time that teachers, ESP, took control of our profession. 
teachers and principals want to be evaluated. They want good feedback on their practice. They just want to make sure that the system is fair and reliable. And when you think about this evening and the title of Building Futures and Changing Lives, Building Futures and Changing Lives, and you saw all these young people up here tonight, and you talk about what, are, what is really the foundation of unions to build futures and change lives. My name's Tim Byrne. I'm the business manager, Local 51 Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. We're at a training facility, and we're hosting a welding event for uh, well, UA Welding Certification, which is a program that is held in conjunction with the National Certified Pipe Welding Bureau. And it really is a, a safety issue for me. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll argue and debate money issues all day with people. Um, but, you know, in the end, money's a business thing. Some we win, some we lose, and you go on your way. But not when it comes to safety issues. Uh, it's real personal to us. And we feel, um, you know, it's a sad and unabashed truth that almost in the construction, the field of construction, every day in this state, every week, every month, people are cheating. Whether they're cheating a prevailing wage or they're just cheating their employees, it happens all the time. It was obvious in the, in the Providence Journal where Bob Kerr made reference to the fact that Verizon really did something more than just for your members. In a tough economy, in high unemployment situations, your members went on strike for workers' rights. It's as simple as that. History is a great teacher. Now everyone knows that the labor movement did not diminish the strength of a nation, but enlarged it. By raising the living standards of millions, labor miraculously created a market for industry and lifted the whole nation to undreamed levels of production. The muckrakers came to town to write about what happened. They interviewed one uh, young Italian woman who was an immigrant, and they said, why are you on strike? And she said, for bread and roses too. Boy, did these people uh, able to encapsulate entire books in one sentence. They were there for bread in order to put food on their table, and the roses represented or were symbolic of all that was good in life, education, entertainment, family life. Why are you on strike? For bread and roses too. The overarching mission of labor has always been to increase the dignity of work. More than wages, more than conditions, it's the dignity of labor. There was a partnership formed with Women and Infants Hospital. That has been a great uh, combination and also it's good for different health systems to also work together. And then the vision broadened even further by bringing in the community allies in order to have the beginning of what we call an escalator. We've been doing this, like we said, for 20 years and last year we, uh, this goes on across the whole country and I believe last year uh, throughout the whole country there was 70.2 uh, million pounds of food collected. And last year we uh, reached our goal, we actually hit 1.1 billion pounds of food since the drive started 20 years ago. In 1987, the organization was formed with a $500 grant from the Providence Central Labor Council. The Labor History Society held its first banquet in 1988 and included people like Ed Brown, Rose Tritendi, Monsignor Edmund Brock, Larry Spitz, Bob McKenzie, and Paul Buell. But I do want to take an opportunity to thank people. And if I was to thank them by name, I'm certainly I'd forget her name. So the people I have to thank are members of Council 94. On December 14, 2012, a horrific tragedy occurred at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. Tonight is an opportunity for the Rhode Island educational community to gather together its teachers, students, administrators, parents, and supporters everywhere to memorialize the victims of that tragedy as a show of solidarity with our colleagues. Hi, I'm Patrick Quinn. I'm with 1199 New England Healthcare Employees Union. We're here at Women and Infants today. Um, we have an informational picket going on. Folks in our union, um, we represent registered nurses, tax, housekeeping, laundry, dietary, all the folks that work in the laboratory. So if you kind of combine them with the 80,000 strong uh, plus, another probably 25,000 uh, non-AFL uh, labor union folks. It's uh, quite a force in Rhode Island.
They can knock us down, but they can't lick us. This is Labor Day. This is our day in Rhode Island, home of the first Labor Day parade in this country. And every working man and woman in this state owes a great debt of gratitude to those who were knocked down and got back up, and to those of us today who continue to march. We are the labor movement. And we say to all you workers, whether you're union or non-union, you're welcome. You're welcome for the eight-hour day. You're welcome for the 40-hour week. You're welcome for child labor laws. You're welcome for safe workplaces. You're welcome for paid vacation and sick days. You're welcome for health insurance and pension. And you're welcome for this Labor Day weekend and every other weekend of the year. Because we're the union and damn proud of it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. As Ryan mentioned, um, uh, Seth Luther was uh, certainly a great proponent uh, of the early uh, labor movement, and uh, Ryan went over pretty much uh, uh, everything he did. And he was part of a, a larger group uh, that existed in Rhode Island and through many other states uh, in the 1830s in particular. They were called the Workingmen's Parties. And in Rhode Island, uh, they went under the name of the Providence and Newport Association of Mechanics. You know, sounds pretty uh, uh, legit there. And um, we mentioned that Slater's Mill started in 1790. That's really the birth of uh, the factory system in America. 1790. And yet I've gone to management uh, talks and speeches like this where if you ask them where the labor movement came from, oh, it was the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Uh, the germs came across the ocean and infected all these pure workers, and they all wanted unions after that, you know, like the germ theory of, of history. <laughs> well, let me, let me make it clear for you. This is a membership certificate in the uh, Newport Association of Mechanics. 1795, a guy named William Briggs, and in those days they used to emboss uh, sometimes the letters or the envelopes, or, uh, sometimes they were both in the two and one. And on this one, the union used as its symbol the honeybee hive because it was labor that created the honey of society. Now, the uh, Providence Association and the Newport Association of Mechanics uh, fought for the right to vote and uh, the 10 hour day and a lot of the things that. Ryan had mentioned. This is a letter uh, from the president of the Newport Mechanics Association going to the Providence counterpart. And you'll see here, the, uh, in the old days before they had envelopes, they would take that piece of paper and fold it up. And then you'd have an envelope right here. And then they would seal it with red sealing wax. You can still see the, the remnants of that uh, on there. But what's interesting about this letter, they're seeking to lobby the legislature of which some people today feel that labor shouldn't be allowed to do when we were doing it long before they'd ever thought of it. And what were they looking for? A mechanics lien law, L-I-E-N, a mechanics lien law. In this case, and for a long time, and it's, it's actually making a comeback now, when working people help make a, build a home or a building or whatever it might be, maybe the arcade, and there was maybe some sort of financial problems, and the uh, uh, contractor had to shut the place down. Well, like vultures on Halloween here, any vultures with the cats there, kind of, or the bats, I guess, the vultures and the bats would come down, and they were the bankers, the insurance company, the commerce people. And who got stuck at the end of the fourth block back? It was the working people who owe, had their wages owed to them. But they couldn't collect. They finally passed the mechanics lien law. They could now go up and rub shoulders with the big shots and demand that they get their money just like uh, the commercial uh, people. So 
Seth Luther uh, got involved, uh, even before Thomas Wilson Dorr did, uh, with these uh, uh, very skilled workers uh, through the auspices of their uh, respective organizations in Newport uh, and Providence. And they tried to reform uh, the Constitution. In fact, there were seven or eight different attempts from around 1800 down to the Dorr War in 1842 to try and make changes, but there was absolutely no mechanism to do it. The General Assembly had to, to do it through its own will to call in a, uh, uh, a change or to have a, a convention in order to look into it. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, Thomas Wilson Dorr, who we'll be getting to in just a minute, uh, Roland Rivet here is down in the, uh, uh, the far reaches of Rhode Island, uh, down at the end of Route 44. And if you ever go down that way, just before you get into uh, Chapachet, um, you'll see this beautiful I'm going to put the pictures out. Oh, okay. A colonial era uh, place that's been redone is going to become the Thomas Dorr Museum and the Thomas uh, the Dorr Rebellion Museum. So uh, Roland's done a fantastic so job the, with that. Which, the restaurant, which is now the town on, town on Main, <laughs> uh, that's, that was Thomas Dorr's headquarters. Amazing. Wow. So the Rhode Island history still lives and it's all around us. Um, the... Um, People's Party was formed, um, and Thomas Dorr pretty much, I don't say he took it over, but he had such an intellect. Uh, he was born uh, of the elite. Uh, he went to Harvard. Uh, he studied with the great legal minds in New York City at that time, came back to Providence, went to the legislature, head of the school committee. This guy could have been anything he wanted. He had it all. But burning in his heart, just like in Seth Luther's, was the uh, idealism of the American Revolution to finally be brought to bear uh, in our little mini paradise here uh, of uh, Rhode Island. So uh, as push came to shove, uh, late 1841, uh, uh, the uh, uh, forces of Dorr and uh, Seth Luther had an extra legal uh, election, one that nobody gave them permission to do, but they had it anyway. And a majority of the people of Rhode Island turned out who could have been eligible to vote and said, yes, we want a constitutional change. It had secret ballots. It had all kinds of wonderful things that the Rhode Island uh, didn't have access to uh, prior to that. Unfortunately, um, the forces of reform, particularly those in the working class, uh, were much more willing uh, to take action to get some of these reforms into practice. While some of the people up around Dorr, who were the same aristocracy that he came from, as soon as push came to shove, they were out. And uh, it was left pretty much to uh, Luther and his people and Thomas Wilson Dorr and some other uh, uh, courageous folks uh, to take on the authorities of the state. And they did that by, in 1842, attacking uh, the state arsenal uh, on Dexter Street in Providence. That's not the Cranston Street arsenal that's there today, uh, but it was right near there. And um, they didn't have much in the way of weapons. They didn't have much in the way of uh, soldiers. They had a couple of ancient American Revolution cannons. I guess, I guess uh, Seth Luther felt that this would be appropriate uh, in, in the memory of his father. And, uh, but that kind of uh, didn't go anywhere, and, and Dorr's troops, along with Luther, kind of disappeared uh, into the night. And eventually, uh, Luther uh, was captured uh, out in Woonsocket, of all uh, uh, places. He was placed in prison in Providence, uh, where he tried to escape by uh, uh, a little subterfuge. He then put him in prison in Newport, uh, where he lit his cell on fire and actually escaped for a short time, but they uh, recaptured him. And then, strangely enough, um, in 1843, they released him. And all I can think of was he was such a pain in the neck that they figured, get rid of him, maybe he'll go away. When he was released, uh, Luther went out to the West again, kind of like what Ryan said he did when he was a young man. He liked to, to travel around. He came back to uh, Rhode Island and New England in 1845, uh, led a 10-hour uh, uh, drive in New Hampshire, of all places. But New Hampshire had a lot of mills, particularly uh, around the uh, shoe uh, industry. Um, and then... In one of the strangest quirks, and I don't know, maybe it was just because he was a social pioneer, 
And sometimes when you're so out front, when you're so far ahead of that curve, uh, when you're out there and you look around and there's nobody with you anymore, you know, who knows what it does to your mind. Uh, it, the things he did were beyond uh, belief. He's going to fight in the Mexican War. And in um, 1846, on his way to Mexico, he stops in Boston. Didn't get too far. And uh, for some uh, unknown reason, in the name of President Polk, he holds up a bank with a sword. And boy, I'd like to have that sword. That'd be great in that uh, museum, uh, Roland. And uh, with that, Seth Luther spends the rest of his life first at the Dexter Asylum, uh, later at Butler Hospital. That's from 1846 to 1858. And as a cost-saving measure, the city of Providence then farms him out to the asylum in Brattleboro, Vermont, because it was cheaper. And Seth Luther died there uh, in 1863, uh, 150 years ago. And uh, he was buried in an unmarked grave. And Carl Gerson, he went up there. And if he told me he couldn't find it, believe me, it's not going to be found, because uh, he was quite, quite the guy. This is the Providence Journal obituary upon his death. Seth Luther, he was a natural radical, dissatisfied with all existing institutions about him, and labored under the not uncommon delusion that it was his special mission to set things right. His ideal of a pure democracy seemed to be that blessed state wherein the idle, the thriftless, and the prolificate should enjoy all the fruits of the labor of the industrious the frugal, and the virtuous. Ooh. The possessors of property everywhere he looked upon as banded robbers whom he hated as born enemies of the human race. Oh he had considerable talent for both writing and speaking, but he was too violent, willful, and headstrong to accomplish any good. Soon after the troubles of 1842, he became insane. Wow, what a... They gave it right back to him, didn't they? Uh, but it's always easier to pick on a dead person, I guess, than it is a, a living one. Um, Luther was a, a great orator. And uh, uh, Rusty Simone in the back, who's probably got the, the best private collection of uh, Rhode Island material uh, anywhere outside of uh, the libraries and the museums uh, in the state, gave me something that in my years and years of collecting, I was never able to get. I always thought I'd find it in a garage sale or a yard sale or somewhere for a couple of bucks, but I never did find it. And here's the address on the right of free suffrage by Seth Luther, 1833. And what I didn't notice until I just looked at the back of this, he gave this lecture in Boston, Charleston, Mass., Portland, Dover, Saco, Cambridgeport, and Waltham. So, I mean, he was all over the place. He was a, a person of uh, great distinction, uh, at least among uh, the working class. Um, in that um, beautiful pamphlet, he says, must we be told we must not speak? Must we have a gag law? Must we shrink from our duty because the hangers-on to the skirts of the nobility tell us to shut our mouths and be silent? No. If we must suffer tyranny, if we must be slaves, let that tongue be palsied, and may that right arm drop off, which will not make an effort to be free. I choose rather to be exposed on a gibbet, die on a rack, or rot in a prison, than to bend the hinges of the knees to the nod of a lord, as such men do for gold. A man who would be a parasite for paltry dust would sell his soul for gold if it were possible to sell such a thing as could dwell in a mustard seed and have tenements to let. What an incredible um, way to say it. And um, Luther, by the way, <laughs> and actually Luther and Dorr and all their followers always had a, uh, a lot of cute phrases uh, to refer to that $134 property qualification. Uh, Luther in that pamphlet calls it the $134 sand bank. 
You know, if you had enough property, and he called it, they would often call it sand or mud or, or make uh, uh, fun of it. Uh, and Luther would also say, uh, all men were created equal, except in Rhode Island, uh, which is kind of a, uh, a nice uh, touch. He said, the celebration of the 4th of July never ought to take place in this state except as a day of mourning. And those who walk in procession ought to be in chains and clothed in sackcloth and ashes. It is all mockery to say we are free when we are not. And every time we assert it, we are guilty of falsehood. The non-freeholders have gained nothing by the revolution if the state of things must continue. But it must not be so. We must have a remedy. Peaceably if we can. Forcibly if we must. I hope there is no person in this house so extremely nervous as to go into spasms at the sound of that last sentence he wrote. <laughs> Keep calm if possible until you see what kind of force we recommend. We assert that every citizen of these United States has a right to vote for his rulers. They, uh, by the way, along uh, the path to the Door War, uh, had presented a uh, petition to the General Assembly uh, signed by 2,000 people, including some of the uh, uh, landholders themselves. And in return, the uh, Speaker of the House uh, called them vagrants and renegades. They petitioned <laughs> to have a constitutional convention, but they weren't very uh, kind to them. Um, and he goes on to say, I just got a few more quotes here, and open it up to you folks. The working men have been deceived by false representations relative to the prosperity of the country. When speculators make money, when the public domain is being converted into worthless rags, when Wall Street robbers thrive and revolutionary soldiers starve. Oh, you got to hear that one again. When Wall Street robbers thrive and revolutionary soldiers starve. I thought we solved all those problems. Then the cry is the country prospers. Business is good. The times are prosperous. When these gentry fail in some of their projects to bleed the people, they cry, the country is ruined. The politician also cries, ruin or prosperity best suits his purpose. I think the country has been ruined accordingly about 40 times in the last 20 years. Um, as late as uh, uh, 1846, uh, Luther, uh, after the Dual War, was still giving uh, uh, labor speeches. And in Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, in 1846, uh, he would present a resolution to a meeting of working people resolved that we look forward with pleasurable anticipations to that glorious time when every man, woman, and child shall sit under their own fig tree with none to molest or make afraid either by unjust legislation, error in legal decisions, unrighteous monopolies, or long and destructive hours of labor either in cotton mills or workshops on the land or the sea. In concluding, let me say, I mentioned at the beginning that in many ways Seth Luther and uh, uh, Ryan uh, made allusion to it too along the way, uh, was really the product of uh, the American Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, one positively and one uh, negatively. And one was very spiritual to him, the American Revolution, and the other was very materialistic, or the Industrial Revolution. And I wanted to, you know, it's easy enough for me to make up a, a maybe even a, a real nice ending, but an old friend of ours who was very active in the Labor History Society many years ago uh, uh, when he lived in Rhode Island, Robert Machesky, uh, has an essay in that pamphlet, uh, that booklet that I passed around that we printed. And, you know, I was reading the end of his, and I said, boy, I couldn't do this any better if I uh, worked on it for the rest of my life. Machewski would say in summing up Luther's influence in life, Luther would end his life in a series of asylums for the mentally disturbed. Perhaps his quest for justice and his failed struggle to find the true meaning of equality was more than he could stand. 
Perhaps he was sane, and the world around him wasn't. In any case, to the end of his life in 1863, Luther retained a deep and abiding faith in the Republican doctrine of equal rights for the individual. In his struggle to attain the end, however, he recognized that such rights were secured only through collective action, that individual rights could exist only within a society committed to the well-being of all of its members, regardless of high or low they sat on the social ladder. And Robert went on to conclude, I am at once reminded of the song penned many years ago by Woody Guthrie, one of the famous uh, uh, folk singers in American history. And Guthrie uh, sang, Jesus Christ was a man who traveled through the land, a hard-working man and brave. He said to the rich, give your goods to the poor. But they laid Jesus Christ in his grave. And Robert ends with this last sentence. So too was Seth Luther, Rhode Island's own carpenter, who preached so eloquently the gospel of labor. Thank you. George, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak on behalf of the uh, educational sector. Uh, I want to begin my remarks by uh, welcoming my colleagues from the NEA. This is their first AFL-CIO convention as delegates in, I have to tell you how fortunate we are in Rhode Island that we have uh, such a great working relationship with our colleagues from the NEA and to echo what Steve and everyone else has said tonight, we're not going to be able to go forward until we're all work, working together and work, working in the same direction. So welcome again and we look forward to many years of continued cooperation. Um, as uh, I, I go to a lot of national conferences on behalf of the AFT, and uh, I can assure you that it's not the same in many of the other states throughout the nation, and that's uh, going to be a fundamental problem if we're all to go to move forward. Um, the education sector, like um, many other private and public uh, colleagues, have been under attack for the past several years. Um, this attack's been sanctioned by the White House, unfortunately, and in our, in our case, uh, under the leadership of Arne Duncan, and, and continues at the state level in Rhode Island. Um, the, the attack that we face is disguised under the cover of something called education reform, and unfortunately, it's demoralized teachers and school support staff while failing to improve education at all and educational opportunities for students. Um, Access to a free public education has been, been the bedrock of our democracy for the past 237 years. Now we have private educational management companies that are funded by wealthy businessmen and foundations that are coming in and attempting to privatize public education for their own personal gain. Um, they're siphoning public funds the much needed public funds and channeling them to these quasi public schools which are not overseen by the elected officials in the jurisdictions where those schools are housed and that's criminal. If you're responsible to fund those schools then the local elected bodies should be responsible to manage them as well. Ultimately if we continue on this trend and they continue to expand, we're going to have two parallel school districts throughout this country, and that's going to be the destruction of public education as we know it, and ultimately it will lead to the destruction of the American middle class. In Rhode Island, we're dealing with a new, newly constituted Rhode Island Board of Ed, which is a combination of the former Board of Regents and a Board of Governors for Higher Ed. While it's still a work in progress, the early signs are that the governance structure needs to be revisited and dramatically changed. Um, teachers throughout Rhode Island right now are overwhelmed by a new evaluation system which was promoted as a means to improve instruction and professional practice but now seems to be a tool to capriciously eliminate teachers and destroy careers by linking teacher evaluation to certification through the use of unproven, invalid, an unreliable application of student test scores. The voices, as you saw in uh, Joe Fleming's poll earlier, the voices of thousands of teachers throughout the state rang out last spring in an effort to stop the contract renewal of Commissioner Gist, the chief architect of this evaluation system. But their voices fell on deaf ears. 
And the lesson that we need to learn is we have to work even harder to elect people, and once we elect them, we have to hold them accountable for the things that they promise us during their campaigns. Um, on, a, on a positive note, at the State House this year, and there are a few small things that are going well, um, at the State House this year, the General Assembly passed a series of school safety legislation. Uh, in response to the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut. Um, while many of our schools had comprehensive safety plans, um, this is an area where we can never be too careful, and every student, parent, employee deserves a right to a safe working and learning school environment. Um, we're also fortunate to have about $600,000 restored for lead poisoning prevention. This ensures that students, particularly or ch children, in, particularly in older urban areas, are safe from the ter terrible consequences of lead poisoning. Um, the ultimate result of this will be to save millions of dollars in the future because the pre prevention of this insidious disease uh, is, is very expensive and oftentimes it's incurable and it leads children to a life where they uh, have difficulty graduating from high school or maintaining employment throughout the rest of their lives. So uh, it was a small amount of money from a, a very large state budget, but it was very important to those uh, people who live in, many times in substandard housing and don't have a, a, a voice of their own. So uh, that was one of the great things that the state did this year. Um, Another important piece of legislation this year was passed, it uh, was introduced by Senator Gallo and it ex exempted individually identifiable evaluation records from public disclosure. And if you followed the news over the past couple of years, this bill is a response to situations in places like New York and California where teacher, teacher evaluations were published in the local newspapers, major newspapers, and uh, they led to senseless tragedies. Um, we're pleased that the House defeated our budget article five, which would have allowed the General Assembly to, to ignore an obligation to put $19 million of surplus revenue into the pension fund. This is important. Um, while there were many good ways that money could have been spent, this is important for two reasons. One, it will help to ensure that the fund reaches its status, its 80% status, so that people at some point in the future we'll be able to get cost, much needed cost of living raises, particularly those retirees who are on very meager, have very meager pension in income. Um, and we're also appreciative that the General Assembly found a way to, to allocate about $6 million in additional revenue to higher ed institutions, which have been starved for several years. Um, some issues that we are watching as we move forward We'll be advocating to include a moratorium and the expansion of mayoral academy charter schools. Uh, minimizing the use of stand standardized test scores for teacher evaluation or student graduation requirements. Um, contract continuation protection when parties reach an impasse. Uh, the restoration of funds for programs which support the developmentally disabled are the, the most vulnerable members of our society. And access to health care benefits for our college adjunct faculty members. And in closing, I just want to thank all of you as delegates that, here tonight for your steadfast leadership to the labor movement during these, the, probably the most difficult times we've seen in our lives. And for all you do, to provide quality services to the children and families of our great state. Thank you.